Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week, we have a look at the 1972 horror film Vampire Circus. This is episode 435. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, Castlebridge Media Publisher. With me from Austin is Deserts of Mars frontman, Tony Salvaggio. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin, Halloween man, comic creator, Mr. Drew Edwards. Say hello, Drew. One lust feeds the other. One lust feeds the other. I love it. And finally, also in Denver, attorney Julia Guzman. Say hello. Hello, but I'm not finally. No, that's that's correct. Because finally, finally, we have a very special guest. Now, this writer, I'm going to do this without saying this person's name. This writer received the Tony Award for his play Red, wrote the book for the Tony Award winning Moulin Rouge. As a screenwriter, he's been nominated for an Oscar three times and has received Golden Globe, BAFTA, WGA, and Edgar Awards. His film work includes, and I'm not making this up, Skyfall, Gladiator, The Aviator, Hugo, Rango, Sweeney Todd, They Them, The Last Samurai, and any given Sunday, uh, I, I just hear that music, the Bill Withers music in my head. He also created the television series Penny Dreadful for Showtime. This November, his musical Swept Away opens on Broadway, and next year, we will see the release of his movie, Michael, about Michael Jackson. We are joined tonight by John Logan. Hello. Woo! Yeah. Hello. So happy to be here. Ginormous fan of this podcast. I think it's the best podcast about genre films. I've been watching genre films for longer than I think all of you have been alive. That so, is nuts. Well, That's well, nuts for you to say that. Well done, you guys. That is, that well, is thank you. fine. We are, we are deeply, deeply honored. I mean, I think all of us, in fact, are nervous around you. I mean, uh, <laughs> it, it's uh, so, so we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best not to be fools and to, and to actually make your time. <laughs> for the uh, first time. Time. Worth, right. worth. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, so th this movie is a film uh, that uh, that that John you chose uh, because because you were like, and I'm going to read a, a, an introduction to what it is in a sec. But um, uh, we were we were talking, and and I was like, come up with a movie, and but um, there were a bunch of stuff that we'd already done that that would be cool to talk about, like like all the Canyon Vampire movies, like you know, and mm -hmm. and 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 then you were like. What about Vampire Circus? And I was shocked that that we had never done Vampire Circus. Like, like, like it's it's I I have no idea how it is that we had never done an episode on it. So so um so wonderful choice. So here, okay. Vampire Circus is a 1972 British horror film directed by Robert Young and star and not not Father Knows Best you know, Robert Young, but yet another Robert Young, starring Adrienne Corey, Thorley Walters beloved hammer guy anthony higgins it was written by judson kinberg and produced by wilbur stark and michael carreras uh for hammer it's a it's a it's a hammer rank production the story concerns a traveling circus the vampire artists uh that are part of it and and their uh their prey on children of a 19th century apparently germanic uh village and to say all of that is not nearly to give the, the the impression of what this movie is, right? So uh, let's get our opening thoughts. Um, you know, and and if you like, you can tell us how you came to this movie. Like 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 you know. Uh, so we're gonna go John, Tony, Drew, Julia, and then we'll go uh, into topics. So John, um, what are your opening thoughts on Vampire Circus? Yeah, this is this is a sensational movie that more people should know. Uh, I just think it's I think it's insane. I think it's ludicrous. I think it's wonderful. I think it's sublime. And I'm a huge you know Hammer fan. You know all the the Draculas with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, particularly Taste of Blood and Scars, the Frankenstein's. You know and the great one-offs from you know like Doctor Jekyll and Sister Hyde, Plague of the Zombies, Devil Rides Out. But if I had one Hammer movie to take with me to Desert Island it would be Vampire Circus. Wow. Mostly because it is so shocking and provocative. And, you know, when you're, when you're like learning how to be a screenwriter, and I came out of playwriting, uh, you know, there's two rules you learn. Don't kill children and don't kill animals. Mm -hmm. And this movie breaks like every rule going. 
and that's what horror movies are supposed to do. And also for like a young gay kid to see a horror movie, my very favorite genre <coughs> where there was actual sort of erotic attention paid to the male characters was sort of I've never I'd never seen that before other than sort of transferring it in my mind from other characters to male characters so I think it's sexy I think it's bloody I think it's I think it's it's wonderful wow and how how many framed posters do you have for this movie I have two that I showed you <laughs> <laughs> they're super cool very very cool um thank you very much uh Tony uh, Tony I remember that you and I in my brain, I remember that we hosted an epi- uh, a show yeah, yeah. of this at the Draft yeah. House uh, in the 2000s. Um, oh, wow, I can't, yeah. I, I can't would, remember, I remember why. I at your house. Well, because at the time we could do that. Like, yeah, we were just programming like we Hammer just, movies at, at the Draft House. I don't even remember. Them when, or they were showing it. It also could have been that they were showing it and they said, hey, you guys, why don't, why don't you intro it? We were yeah. lucky enough to do that. Yeah. Um, I know we watched it at your house too, because yeah. I think that's the first time I saw it uh, was, you know, hanging out and we were both into hammer horror, probably while we were writing Blockworks, possibly. It's possible. I think it was when we were working for Electronic Arts, honestly. Oh, I think maybe. It was like way back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that, that would fit. But um, yeah, but that, and it just blew, it blew my mind at the time. Um, you know, it was at a, also at a time where, a lot less stuff was readily available on video. Yeah. So you kind of had to search for it a little bit more. And I just, yeah, I, it's fantastic. Um, everything you said, John, plus I just love how interesting and lurid and, and just the, the tension that's there too, because you have a, a town trapped between these two plagues an actual plague and a plague of vampires and how they're dealing with all of that. Like there's, they packed a lot in this movie. Yeah, It's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, fantastic performances um the interplay between all the people who are the others and this town and kind of who's evil because you oh oh, well they're being set upon by vampires but they're also readily you know they're they're all too ready to to whip a woman for her transgressions and burn down a a man blow up a mansion right so there's there's all the seedy underbelly of a town as well um yeah it's there's a lot to discuss and there i they packed it to the gills there's so much it's it's just amazing in that respect (laughs) Drew, Mr. Drew, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I had a weird winding road to finally seeing this movie. When I was in high school, our high school drama teacher, Mr. Cody, had a very large poster of this, this, the Vampire Circus poster in his office. And for the longest time, I assumed, because I knew I, I had you know, knew what Hammer was and I'd seen, you know, a fair share of Hammer movies. I'd never seen Vampire Circus, but I had a vague notion of what it was. And I just assumed that this mean, meant that uh, Mr. Cody was a horror movie fan. So one day uh, I, I kind of worked up the nerve to ask him about it. And he was like, oh, I've never seen this movie. I just <laughs> think the poster was funny. Um, so huh. that in my head started building this movie kind of up, yeah. you know, just having to look at this poster all the damn time. So when I, when I moved from Possum Kingdom to Dallas, uh, I, I finally was able to obtain a copy of this movie at uh, a place that is no longer there, uh, but it's called Forbidden Books and Forbidden Video. And, you know, it was a mixture of a video store and an occult bookstore. So it was a fascinating little little place. And I fi- when I finally got around to see it, boy, howdy, did it ever live up to, to that poster. Like, it's everything that Tony and, and John was saying was, it's lurid, it's gory. And in, in, in many ways, I think, uh, you know, when people think about a Hammer movie, they're probably thinking of a lot of the stuff in this one because it's it's got all the like sexuality and gore that you know not necessarily like the early 50s hammer movies uh have uh i also love the fact that it that it uh has these sort of art house elements and and you know some throwbacks to to silent movies like nosferatu and things like that there's just a lot of of wonderful working parts in this movie and i just you know, it every time I rewatch it, 
I, 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 I agree with John. I don't understand why this isn't talked about more in the conversation. Uh, when, when people bring up Hammer, uh, this is this should be talked about more because it's it's a really fabulous movie. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Had you seen this movie before? Well, I was going to say, in part, and you can blame us because we haven't covered it. I can't believe we haven't covered it in all these years. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. It's just, it really feels like it, it should have been one of our early, earlier films that we covered um, because it is classic Hammer, and it has uh, it has all the classic Hammer elements, but as John was saying, it also defies a lot of the rules. So um, I thought it was really interesting. I, I liked how it looked. I liked, um, you know, for me, I've said this before, the nudity is excessive. I was like, okay, okay, we get it. Although the naked dancing, you know, tiger chick or whatever she was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, she was painted. Um, but I thought, um, I thought it was, I thought it was well done, well acted. Um, I really liked that some of the choices they made were really daring. Like I, I, I said, um, I can't believe that the actual actor is fighting off a torch with a sword and the torch is like in his face. And then at another point he catches the torch with his hand. There's a lot of things that happen in this film that I was just like, that's real. Or that's, you know, or that's um, the practical effect is amazing here. So that was pretty cool. Um, but once we get into it, Jason, I kind of, my first question is, um, is how does Don, how do you approach a film like this or any film? As a screenwriter, do you approach it as a screenwriter, or are you just a fanboy like the rest of us? You You're can answer boy. that now if you want. Yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, go, <laughs> yeah. go ahead. I, I, I try to be a fanboy um, because that's—I didn't start as a screenwriter. I didn't start as a playwright. I started as a kid who loved ventriloquism and horror movies and Shakespeare, you know, and and puppets. Uh, and and so I try to watch it just as a fan. And if the movie is good and it draws you in and it weaves a spell, I stop being a screenwriter and I just, I become a fan. I tend to notice certain things. And because um, I'm primarily a playwright, I listen to dialogue a lot. Mm. And I'm almost very cognizant of something people don't think about a lot, which is like the first lines that are spoken in a story are very important. Like Hamlet famously starts with who's there mm. in a play about identity. And the first line a vampire circus, which will tell you everything you need to know about the movie is, is Anna. Mm. It like goes to the little girl and she says, there you are. You didn't think I'd catch you. Mm -hmm. And then begins the horror of little, uh, that little kid's journey through the next 10 minutes of the movie. It doesn't waste you know, any time. This film, it does not waste no. any time. Gets right into the action. Yeah. Wow. And a lot of, a lot of action too. That's uh, but that's very interesting. Uh, before we go into the topics, uh, John, uh, that, that, that is fascinating that, that you're not watching and going, um, you know, I would really, I would really move the introduction of this character to like, like 20 minutes into the film instead of 40 or, 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 or whatever. Yeah, never. I, I never, I never think about structure because I think, you know, you, you hear, you know, when people come with me and say like, well, what screenplay book do you recommend? Yeah. I say, you know what I recommend? Read Hamlet, read King Lear, you know, mm -hmm. read, read, get the, get yeah. the book to Hamilton and study that read West Side Story, you know? Mm. Uh, and the idea of the three act structure is nonsense. That was created by, you know, executives trying to justify their jobs. So I never <laughs> think about I never think about structure. I think about am I leaning in? Is this exciting? Is like mm. what what am I am I am I captivated by what I'm by what I'm uh, I'm what I'm watching? Yes, structure is never it for me. That's wonderful. That's that is that is really really cool. Okay, um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about here is um, I've been fascinated by Hammer films since I was a kid. There's what I call the classy to trashy continuum in Hammer, where if you take the early stuff, like, like the 57 Dracula and the 1960 Brides of Dracula, those movies are classy. And they have um, all of the sexuality is like under the surface. It's all pushed down and sublimated and, and whatever. And the films themselves have a very gauzy look about them. And then by the time you get to like this period of 69, 70, 71, 72, uh, they start to be trashy is probably not a fair way to put it, but, but like, like much more brightly lit, much more crisp in the film. And there's much more nudity there's much more like body humor and, 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 you know, puns and, you know, and, and, um, and I've just always been fascinated by how, how hammer runs the gamut like that. Uh, uh, but I don't know where this movie fits because I have to say as sexy as this movie and as much nudity as this movie has, this movie is really 
pretty cerebral and is almost more like some of those earlier earlier hammer pictures does anybody follow me on this or am i just talking blather at this no, point? i i i get you i think they just pushed a lot of the levers <laughs> like we're gonna here we're gonna push that one and there's more sex and then also here's this whole uh you know plague part and people are are fearful of their lives that they try to escape and then there's that and it just i don't know i well, and I, the true horror of endangering children and, and oh, exactly. And that, yeah. I mean, there's just stacks upon stacks of things. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's it's also part of like what was going on in in cinema then, which is you know, I, like I never you can never overestimate the importance of 1968 with Rosemary's Baby, Night mm-hmm. of the Living Dead. Quickly after this movie, you're getting The Exorcist, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The British film industry is tanking. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, Hammer lost a lot of its American distributors. James Carreras, who founded the company, is out. His son, Michael Carreras, is in, trying desperately to keep relevant. So when they did, I think Vampire Circus, for me, with Ingrid Pitt, is the big transitional point, where suddenly they embrace... Vampire Lovers. Because, right. Yeah, because, yeah, exactly, Vampire Lovers, because the, the rating system changed in Britain, and they could. They, they raised the age for, for their what was their oh, yeah. X rating. Uh, so suddenly you had real full frontal nudity, and and the sort of buckets of blood trying to stay yeah. relevant, trying to, to like what 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 desperately it was like desperation to try mm. to come up with new things. But from that, I think you get innovation. Mm. I think you get Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, which is a great piece of queer cinema, a pro queer cinema. You get mm. Vampire Circus. You get you get Twins of Evil, which is the most morally complex yeah. camera movie I can even think of. So it, all of that is sort of tied into like the, the economics of the film industry. Then Michael Carrera saying, "Oh God, I don't want to lose the family business," you know. And so so bold choices were made. Wow, that that makes sense. So so you know, there's the the way that we look at it is suddenly that like my gosh 1972 is a lot different from 1960 like huge on the film on the screen and i guess uh in reality as well another thing happened of course which is manson in 69 yeah. and and you know which which just had this this catalytic effect on all films you know and and suddenly things were much much bloodier i think um, drew wanted to say something Jay. yeah go man you know, I, I I think you know going going back to the the idea of trashy versus classy. Um, what I find interesting about these later hammers is you know even though they were trying to, as John was saying, answer the 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 horror films that were then coming out of America, they still had to keep them on brand for what hammer was they're still gothic they're still period pieces you know they're still counts they're still angry villagers they're still yes all these like classic horror movie tropes that go all the way back to universal and that's yeah. because you know even though they were mixing up the the brand you know they they it still had to be a hammer movie yeah in, you're right in, and i think that's yeah. why these are so fascinating is that you know they've evolved uh you know the sort of formula that terence fisher started way 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 back with with dracula and um you know i i like you know movies like people can con- contain multitudes like something can be both luridly sexual and luridly violent and still be cerebral at the mm-hmm. same time and i think that's one of the reasons why i you know I always like once I watch one Hammer movie, like if it's been a minute, I immediately like after I was done watching with this, I had to really fight like, oh, I could go watch the reptile like Hell right yeah, now. Man. I could watch oh, Captain Kronos, nice. you know, yeah. like it's because it, there's just like a flavor to this that you want more of. And it's because it scratches a certain itch as a horror fan. I'm telling yeah, and you, it's a, go ahead. I'm sorry, please. Yeah, and you're right. It's the Hammerscape. You're exactly right. It's like you turn it on, you see the Eastman color. And you're like, you see the Kensington Gore, that unique blood, which yeah. they use the same formula for blood until their very last horror film, To the Devil a Daughter, where they use realistic-y kind of blood because the exorcist had come out. There's something about that, those sort of dark fairy tales, Middle Europe, the castles, the look of it, the lighting of it, the claustrophobic interior sets they're trying to sell as forests that are that are so that become become a grab. That's a that's a computer game I want. That's the one I want to I want to walk into. I'm telling it's you, like tempera paint yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the the hammerscape 
I fell in love with it the moment I saw it. And and it just it just was a place that I wanted to escape to. That this this world of like of like, you know, the 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 wenches and the in the bar and the and the and the steins and the burgermeisters and and it's kind of Germany, it's kind of Middle Ages, it's kind of Victorian. <laughs> like New Orleans. It's its own I mean, not New Orleans, world. New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It it's just its own world that makes no it's just a universe all its own. Like there's a Star Trek universe there is a hammer universe now they Ooh. never bothered because i think this vocabulary maybe didn't exist at the time well no it sure sure it did because universal did it hammer never bothered to stitch their whole world together and they could have well, how how would you have done that because you would have had van helsing versus frankenstein and they're played by the same guy how hard is that <laughs> you just said it yeah. yourself that's uh you know that's that's easily done that's no problem they're cousins it's fine i i oh. it's like I also think or you could you could have had Peter Cushing Frankenstein versus or Peter Cushing Ben Helsing versus Ralph Bates Frankenstein. Versus I, there you go. Yes. I, I think you also hit on something that you know far too often we see, especially lately, we see, oh, this has to be this realistic, or you know, this has to follow these. Like, no, that's the magic of cinema. That's what makes us love Hammer. Is it's not that, it's its own thing. It invites us in. It's like a painting, or like this this idea that realism has to be the be all end all. I those stages... I get it, but also I just I wish more people thought about well, what made you fall in love with film. What made yeah. you fall in love with cinema? It was this, it was, you know, for a lot of people, it's this, like, yeah, it was like hyper art. real everything. Like, why, why would you, you know, why are we making, why are we, why are we straying from the path? I mean, like, it's fine to be uh, bold and colorful. Yeah, if you, and if you go and to a museum, you don't just yeah. look at the realists, you look at all the. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Excellent point. I want to make a mention of those stages that uh, John was talking about. You know, they'll, they'll I mean, like often they are outside and, and in the trees and stuff like that. But there is a special look, especially when Hammer is presenting like a ruined castle. And I'm thinking about in Vampire Circus and in Lust for a Vampire and in another, a few other movies. Um, where the the you know the greenhouse of the castle or the or the or you know the rooftops in in um dracula's risen from the grave it's stage bound you know you're on a stage and yet there's somehow it's so it, it's more than believable it's extra believable if, if that makes any sense and and i just i just absolutely love it i want to live in that world of of those stages you know i was i was just watching a bunch of shaw brothers films and they they're even tighter like and oh, they'll yeah. have a set. They'll have a set where the the sky is painted on the set, and you can really tell it's the sky is painted on the set. It, really, once you once you get into two K and four K version, like you really see it. Yeah, but it doesn't and, matter because it's so just cool, and what they're yeah, doing and in those scenes are cool. And and there's something there's something like bespoke and and sort of handmade about that about yes, about a stage absolutely. set. Sweeney Todd was shot entirely on sound stages. Okay. And to see the artistry of how they created Victorian London and the skyscapes and the beaches all within, and obviously, you know, Tim Burton's a huge Hammer fan and he was inspired by that. We were shooting yeah. some of the actual stages um, at Shepperton where they shot some of the later movies. Yeah. Uh, but, but there's 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 an artistry and, and a thoughtfulness to that. Uh, and it's curated in a way that if you go out and shoot on the street, well, there's a street. And I really yeah. don't need that many stage lights for it because this is reality and we know what reality is. Uh, but I personally do not go to the movies for reality. I have plenty of reality in my life. I can go to the Ralphs and go shopping for milk and get reality. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Although I've discovered something recently is that I, I uh, uh, Adam Foshko, who's often on the show, um, mm -hmm. talked about the snow globe aspect of plopping a camera, of watching a movie where they plop a camera onto like Sunset Boulevard in 1969 or, or, or go to the grocery store, like in the house across from the uh, house across from the cemetery. I'm trying to remember the name of that Italian movie, mm -hmm. but um, uh, house at the edge of the cemetery. Anyway, she goes grocery shopping and it's this like local chain in New England and she walks out with the paper bags and stuff like that. And that can be very, very cool, but that's not our world. It's still not our world. And so it's kind of cool to like es escape, uh, escape to that. Um, well, anyway, I, I, we should, we should move on. So the central conceit of this movie is a, just a killer conceit that I cannot believe we hadn't seen before. And it is this traveling circus of vampires and it's called the circus of night. And Tony, you had brought up, uh, uh, while we were talking pre-taping, 
um, about uh, about some of the the antecedents of this, and and uh, John, you, you you might have you might have as well, trying to figure out like like where this had come from and 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 where you'd seen this before. Um, Tony, do you remember any of these? Or oh yeah, that? I mean we we talked about probably the closest would be Universal and the uh, you know like werewolf movies where you kind of come into a camp, but yeah, you know I think the cool thing about the circus uh, is that it is. Uh, it's got a lot of, there's a lot of advantages to being this circus of vampires. You can travel, uh, you're in and out, you can seduce the locals and then leave, try not to get in trouble. Um, it's also where it's okay to be an outcast, mm. like, and they can amp that, like that. There, there's also a horror, you know, one of the great things about horror is this like play on outcasts and, uh, you know, who's the other uh, really and you know here we have it they're actually evil but it also makes for a great mixture of um you know and it's kind of surprise yeah, later on who's, against... a who's a vampire yeah. who's not uh because they eventually we learn and that becomes a, a thing like you know because the vampires are affected by vampire rules like crosses are, are bad for them and you know and but all of that and i i just love there's again they pack it just full like there's a whole section where uh you know the clown who's a little person also has a side gig uh you know leading people through the woods and for money whether they survive or not he doesn't care because a he's a he's a monster and hey you know i get a little bit of extra money during the day um you know these vampires also seem to not be as affected uh during the day because they're you know they come through the town if, if at all uh yeah, yeah. The, i i don't i don't think that they're affected by by sunlight uh, at uh all, these, these i guys. and they're, they're kind of and they're also kind of called by their uh you know vampire uh was a cousin a brother right to to come help uh so there's this idea that there's a you know underground network of vampires who can reach out it's uh, a big know, it's and, a big advancement of the hammer universe that suddenly you right. have vampire what? networks and the well, circus what yeah. i like about the the relationships between the two vampires in this is you have one character the count which is more of like what you think of being a hammer vampire he's a count he lives in a castle he's part of the aristocracy um where is emil in the circus like they're more where movie monsters are going into mm -hmm. like the 70s and 80s they're 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 working class um i hadn't thought about that that and and it's 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 kind of like he got his blue collar cousin to come in and help him out and i think you know something i often talk about when i'm talking about like the progression of movie monsters is you know you look at like the classic you know monsters like dracula and frankenstein it is all this idea of um you know here's here's these things that are foreign and they're from over there and they're they're not on the you know really part of your world whereas these circus performers they are people with a job you know they just are also vampires and and in in a way that does feel Again, in, in the 80s, all the monsters became very, like, you know, like Freddy, Jason, Chucky, with the exception of Pinhead, like all the 80s monsters were very blue collar. I and I, I feel like this this movie, whether intentionally or not, seems like a, a, a precursor to that, at least to me. Hmm. I want to, wait, Tony, oh, I wanted to, to come back to something that you said a minute ago. Um, so the whole thing, yeah, basically what you both have been saying about the, kind of the tradition of it uh the thing about the crosses i wanted to get to because i find it really interesting that this film also has the same belief that something else we watched recently i can't remember what it was where everything was across like there was oh the window is across but it only uh got the power of the cross when someone directed it at so so mm -hmm. in other words that um Whenever the 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 young um, the young one, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at the names, so I'm not remembering anybody's names. But she's Fun. she's walking across the uh, the um, like the catwalk. Yeah, her name is Dora. Dora. Dora, thank the, you. Of the, course, the daughter I, kept, of, I kept I kept talking about how she was exploring things. The daughter uh, right. of, of Mr. Mueller. Yeah. Dora is walking up on the. Um, the uh, I forget the archaeological. I mean, the, oh my god, I can't, I'm tired. Obviously, the architectural term. 
or the kind of the catwalk in the church, yeah. or whatever, but it's the big beam. She's walking across and there's a giant cross right there. And the vampire is looking at her, but as soon as she touches the cross, suddenly he's affected by it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then there was something else that was like that. It was the crossbow or something. And when, when suddenly when they direct it at the vampire, the cross affects. So I, I just love when you come back to this idea that the cross has the power that is imbued upon it by the possessor or the you know the person behind it um and you have to have the faith and i know we've watched a couple things where if somebody didn't have faith in the cross it didn't matter or or if somebody had something else you know star of david or whatever they had there is one where dracula says you have to have faith for that for that to work i'm trying to remember which one that was that might have been in taste of blood it's not a dracula it's fright night Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, I think building on it is 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 the question of what where what is and this is relating to everything you were saying. What is what is the what is the power structure of this movie? Because normally it's like it's the church and mm-hmm. it's the and it's the old white men and it's the burgomaster and it's the it's civilization and the monster is threatening that by being foreign, by being a blood sucker, by being gay, by being a person of color, by being a monster. That is not the case in Vampire Circus. In Vampire Circus, the townspeople are repellent. They're horrible, <laughs> you know? And like, you know, the ritual humiliation they put that woman through in the, fir- in the pre-title sequence makes you absolutely loathe them, no matter what their motivation is. And they remain repellent and suspicious and racist against gypsies, against all these people. I think, yeah. I think subtly homophobic against Emil as well with his, with his beautiful diamond choker. Um, so the question of what's the established order that we never questioned in the original Dracula, the early 60s uh, hammers, would never question the church in something like Devil Rides Out is completely questioned here. Yeah. Uh, because the characters who we, I think, are fighting for in a way are not the insipid kids. It's like these misunderstood vampires trying to get revenge and stand up for themselves and be sort of unique, oddball, the oddball creatures they are admittedly with certain needs and hungers. Well, it's like the, this is the point in these movies where you've now got two cults of kind, kind of equal dignity that are sort of at war with one another, like, like a, a couple of gangster families or something, where the movie's not choosing sides over who's necessarily... I mean, they'll put their thumb on the scale, but the vampires have good reason. In Twins of Evil, Peter Cushing is a horrible person. You know, even though in the end the vampires are going to get killed because that's the kind of movie it's going to be. But um, you're exactly right. It's a it's an alternate cult, really. Well, and the movie does not take, like you said, does not take sides. It is, it's a morally ambiguous thing because when everybody is beating this poor woman, um, it's because she's adulterous, maybe, but also she's with a vampire. So, like, well, kind she's of adulterous, as, as, but it's the vampire thing, probably more than. But I'm saying, actually, good no, question. I don't that's know. That's what I'm saying. I think that we, as that, that's why I think it's morally ambiguous, because I think as we, as the viewer, are supposed to go. Well, I mean, she is kind of vampire-y. I don't know if she's a vampire yet, but she's in it with them but they don't really know that they're pretty much just beating her because of the adultery no you're right (laughs) you're right it's a it's they're appalled by the sexuality but yeah but it's not there's a great i mean it's it's terrible in the movie but there's a great piece bit of acting where you see the one guy who all of a sudden they cut to him and he is ready to like no no we need to beat her and his face turns and he's just this he's like everything horrible about this town looking for an excuse, you just yeah. embody it in that face and you know the actor does just such a good job of turning that and you're like oh it's so repellent but it, it is where this town is at at the moment but and, what's what strikes me about oh, that is so, well, by the time this movie is over because we're we can do spoilers you know the young lovers who are innocent um are almost the only people who survive the whole movie <laughs> like like there are some other extra random extras around at the end but all of the main characters all the vampires and the town folk um the town leaders are all dead except for young hans and his lover dora they are you know they're they're the only pure ones basically who 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 get to who get to survive the film so that's the film kind of agrees with you john that everybody kind of deserves to be dead yeah it's the most 1972 ending ever because it was like (laughs) forget it jake it's chinatown you know, yes. it's like literally there's so many bodies around the crypt at the end. The guy like doesn't know where to walk to move through the set. It's, it's like, so it's like, great. 
Oh my Toyota gosh. and Cressida, they're all dead. And then, then, but like the actual, what's the final flourish at the end of the movie? Genius. It's a bat flying away. Yes. As if to say this story goes on. Yes. Yeah. I wish, man. I mean, that. I, that... Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. There's a remake that I should be writing right now, as or, a matter of fact. Well, now it would be a legacy sequel where you would just sort of <laughs> retell it and then. And they go, I don't know, it's IP. I mean, it's 50 yeah. years old, but, you know, better it than counts. nothing. Um, <laughs> the- Anton, I, I just want to mention that kid, uh, um, Ant- young Anton, is um, played by John Mulder Brown. Now, this guy, I only know from one other movie, and it's a movie that Tony and I watched during COVID, which is La Residencia, or The, the House That Screamed, which is yeah. one of my favorite favorite yeah. mid-century italian spanish euro trash horror it is so good um about somebody who is killing these girls in a boarding school somewhere in spain or italy it's hard to tell and 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 it's and the payoff it has a payoff that is fabulous and this kid is great uh, he's he's really good i don't know what became of him i i'm just a philistine he probably had a wonderful career i don't know anything about his career but he was really good in these two horror films so yeah yeah uh the, gosh one of, one of the things i really like about this movie is the doctor character who is basically trying to cure the the rabies plague yes. in this town and in any uh, if he was not in a horror movie he would be right. He's like, there's no such thing as vampires. You're, you know, there's, there's rabies. It's caused by bats. You are all superstitious. I'm going to the capital peace. And then when he comes back, like he disappears for basically the entire movie. And then he comes back and he's completely changed his tune. And yeah. I, that that cracks me up. So this movie has more story much. than it knows what to do with. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the scene when the doctor goes away is interesting because the whole thing is that the town has this plague, and so they've been um, I, they've been cut off by by the neighboring towns. The roads have been blocked, and so nobody can leave. So the doctor's going to leave, and his son um, is is going to be a distraction. To draw the gunfire from these crazy again the crazy all the crazy town folk they're the people in the other towns also are looking for any excuse to shoot somebody so yeah. they're like oh hey somebody's coming near us they start shooting at him and uh he's basically like you missed and then they're like shoot some more um so <laughs> the doctor the doctor rides off and i guess they don't shoot him for some reason um but then the the circus comes into town and everybody's like why how did you get past the um the roadblocks and i still don't exactly know because you know the the um the little person can, shows them kind of a shortcut through the forest but the whole circus didn't do that they so i'm wondering jedi if mind powers i mean yeah right, it's jedi exactly. mind powers or is it yeah. that the neighboring towns were like oh no we don't care who goes in we just don't want anybody coming out. someone someone referenced <laughs> earlier in our, our pre-chat uh something wicked this way comes the great ray bradbury book I think it's, I think, which is one of my favorite 10 books. I think it's like that. I think it's an enchanted yeah. carnival. It's like the yeah. enchanted train that comes through in, at midnight and doesn't Glamour. really exist. Yeah. And then suddenly it's there and offering temptations. The other thing that's crazy about that, the circus of night is like, People are getting slaughtered left, right, and center, and the town keeps going back to that circus like every night. I mean, well, I know no well, it's part of the same connection. magic. It's part of the same yeah. magic. No, because- I think it's just that it's a shit town, and there's not much to do. <laughs> it's <laughs> both, but but if you lived in a small enough town, it's both. It's the seduction yeah. part because it's it's the other again, and also there's nothing to do. So when the young girl is like, "Mom, why can't Dad doesn't want me to go with the Please. actors, like the circus Please. people, like and you know there and there's a history in musicals as well, right? The, the you know, hey, Absolutely. what's with these actors? And also in real life, yeah. like why why actors and troops were kicked out of towns and stuff because oh, you're still our women, you're still our men, you're still like you know that that no, you're it, totally right. as old as time <laughs> in that respect. Yeah. And so <laughs> when she's just, I don't, and she's full of hormones and angst at her age and she goes why won't you let me go out with this actor and the mom is kind of like well you know he's i get it you know your dad's never gonna let you but you know <laughs> i understand uh, why I kinda, you like, want to make out with a hot panther like that's a good segue sure the, yeah, for me, I would, as soon as I was thinking when they were doing the circus, as soon as Emil jumps through the air and turns into a panther, 
Um, I would have been like, nope, <laughs> I'm out of here. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. No, 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 Rosa, just, Rosa's just the opposite. Yeah, yeah the exactly. Opposite. <laughs> oh, can like, I feel like this camera, this movie loves Anthony Corlin, Anthony Higgins so much yes. as a meal. It's like it yes. spends more time studying his lips than it yes. does like practically yes. anything else in the movie. It really features it, his lips a lot. I mean, yeah, a and lot. He, and he's, he's like that smolder and the Black Panther and the little diamond choker. It's like, oh, I am all in for a meal, I'll, let me tell you. And <laughs> I will say that I had forgotten about it. The, the scene where you think it's the eyes of this panther and then it's i love that boots. the boots <gasps> that was cool oh, that's that's magic that's cinema that's cinema yeah. like oh well, that, that was for... such a cool like they, they didn't have to do that and the fact they did like oh everybody involved in that aces just that's totally when the great. poor girl is, is hiding from i know um, <laughs> i think it's is that the neighboring the neighboring yeah. guys that are trying to hunt her right because people. she's trying to get out they're trying to escape, and so she is running through the woods, and she gets down um, into the brush to avoid them, and suddenly realizes she's surrounded by dead people. And boy, I gotta say, I oh, gave big yeah. time kudos to that girl for not <laughs> screaming her head off. I would have been like, "Oh my god!" You know, freaking out. She's just like, "Oh, dead people everywhere," but I gotta keep quiet because these guys are gonna shoot me because they really want to shoot somebody. You know I what's wanna... also magic? Uh, sorry, and I don't mean to interrupt, but like the fact that it goes from and uh i've told the story i've actually seen you know mountain lion eyes at that same level when i was like five so that is truly scary by the way <laughs> uh maybe maybe that's another reason why it resonated with me but this idea that that panther is so dangerous and when it's it's revealed it's still more like being like the fact that it's a vampire is probably more dangerous than the panther and just that subtext that everything about that just great so yeah John, you were saying that. Well, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, steer us to the next topic, uh, which starts with Emil, so that we can spend a little more time on him. Sure. Uh, but everybody, which is just the sexuality of this movie, because I think it's the thing that resonates with people the most um, after they see it. You know, when Dracula 2000 came out, and that was, was that, was that? Who uh, who was the star of Dracula 2000 now? Um, uh, was that it Russell the Gerard Butler? Butler one? It was Gerard Butler. But it was Gerard right. Butler playing Anthony Corliss uh, as as uh, as Emil. Everything with the puckered lips and the and the the mm. the big painted eyes and and everything the way he moved. Bored half the time. Oh, he's he's so uh, he's so like they even do this long thing where uh, the girl is brushing her thumb across his lips and everything just the sexuality of this guy he's the ingrid pitt of this movie and that's <laughs> really interesting i mean john to your point that is like 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 christopher lee was never sexed up this much you know yeah this is it, a new you know thing. look as a as a lifelong horror fan from the time i was like i can first saw like barnabas columns i was seven it's like i'd never seen queer horror until i saw vampire circus because mm -hmm. i i thought the, the, as we talked about earlier, the gay gaze was very, is very satisfied. And yes, there's an abundance of female flesh. There's also an abundance of male flesh mm -hmm. that's, that's treated in a very sensual way with Count Mit Mitterhouse in the, in the first opening scene. And, and with, David um, slash Dave Prowse. Yes, all the way through. And his, yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and, and nothing more so than, than Emil, the character of Emil who's presented as sultry and powerful and, and sort of lethal in that sort of really bad boy way with those like ginormous rattlesnake, you know, teeth, uh, you know, and I think that's revolutionary for horror in 1972, revolutionary. Uh, and maybe I'm reading into it because I'm gay and, and I, I, I was so desperate to see that sort of imagery in my genre, but watching the movie again and again and again, reading the script and having a bunch of copies of the poster, you know, it's like, I don't think so. I think there was an awareness, even if it's even if it's a uh, subtextual awareness of the filmmakers, that there's a change in the air. You know, Stonewall has happened, mm. you know, and and there's there's a tremor going on that's going to lead to things like Sunday, Bloody Sunday and and sort of serious treatments of, of queer issues that is beginning to infect and the horror genre in a really, I think, glorious way uh, in this movie. That's amazing. I, I was I was thinking about the only antecedent, antecedent I could think of where a male vampire was presented, even anything close to this attractively, was the guy in Brides of Dracula, uh, yeah. the, who's, who's, who's 40 years old, but he looks way younger than yeah. 40, and he's, and he's blonde, and he's pretty, and, and he has that sort of slow and 
uh, uh, a sort of ironic way of talking. Like he's way more, yeah. uh, I, th th there's just something a lot more expressive about him than. Yeah, and that's, that's David Peel who played, that's completely true, but, but that movie is a completely heterosexual presentation of romance and sexuality. In Vampire Circus, in ways that are sometimes disturbing, there is intimacy between, for example, Heinrich, one of the two like uh, gymnastic twins, mm. and the boy he's about to murder. And that's, that's the real provocation of this movie is child oh. abuse and, and, and child endangerment. You know, even in the, the pre-title sequence, you know, Count Mitterhaus has a little girl, a little blonde girl, and he's unbraiding her hair in a very intimate way before he kills her, before he has this very sex positive sex scene with the woman. Yeah. And it's those, those tremors of uncertainty and degeneracy and, and illegality that make this a provocative and very worthwhile movie. And that's why when we talk about the hammer continuum of trash to class, this is both of those completely, I think. And as yeah. someone was saying before, a movie can be lurid and intellectually and morally provocative at the same time, you know, yeah. and I, and you know, in my work, that's exactly what I tried. As Penny Dreadful was exactly about that. Every yes. episode, I I tried to do something outrageous and to to sort of walk that vampire circus line. Wow. Do you think that the movie thinks that um, puts the sexual predator, ch child predator thing on the same level? as everything else, because it kind of feels like it does to me, uh, because you have Anna in that same scene you were just talking about where the Count is unbraiding her hair. Anna's getting fully turned on by that. That's and right. And I'm just like, and, and then right. also, you know, like you said, the boy later, um, it really does seem like it just kind of goes, it's all the same, you know, vampirism, you know, child predator, bestiality, if you're considering that all these people are also animals, um, homosexual, all of it, it's all the same. It's all, it's all just, you know, hedonism or I don't know. There seems to be something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's that it's deviance versus whatever the hell is the opposite of deviance. But I don't like, think like, it, I don't think the opposite of deviance yeah. is in this film, except for maybe the, the the youths that make it to the end. I guess the purity, purity yeah. is what it is. Because they also you have the villagers who want to beat the crap out of everybody, and the other villagers who want to shoot everybody. So yeah, I think that is that well. The, it's important to note that the 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 kids that survive the the boyfriend he isn't so quick to judge the circus people yeah so right. he he does tow that middle ground of of uh i i don't want to say liberalism and conservatism because i don't think that's what's such a modern concept yeah progressivism um, I, I don't i don't even know right. what you would say yeah uh, open-mindedness i mean i guess I don't sure know. okay sure yeah wow uh, I, I, one of the reasons I love the sexuality of the Hammer movies, by the way, and, and this is one of the most complicated ones, is I think that that sort of strange tension goes all the way back to even movies like Vampire, uh, like Kiss of the Vampire in 1963, where mm -hmm. there's, you know, the vampires are in the parlance of the movie, the vampires are evil, and yet they're obviously sexy. If you reach the point if you went forward in time enough that they were just an alternate way of living, you get rid of the tension and it's not as interesting. There's something more interesting when, when there's a temptation to go with a vampire as opposed to if it's just, if it's just a, so, uh, which is, which is completely different from how we think about human sexuality and human behavior. But in, 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 uh, in these fairy tales, the excitement is in that, in that tension of whether these are bad guys or whether these are good guys. And and it switches back and forth. It's just like constantly. You have to be bad to be sexy. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And that's the and that's there in the cautionary tale. You right. know, of like, ooh, ooh, be careful who you think is sexy. Be careful how 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 nice though that choker looks because these are dangerous people. So how far are you willing to go? Right. You know, that's that's the challenge. Yeah. Going with the bad boy is a story. Going with the circus performer, that is like the stuff of Tom Petty songs. That's the, that's a that's a an American story that's been around probably, there's probably a version of that in colonial times. It's and, the stuff of Dateline. I mean, it's like literally, well, actually, people get the themselves. Highwayman was a version of that. Come to think of it, the highway, it really does go back to colonial times. I, I, I also, you know, talking about like the forbidden fruit aspect, I mean, I think that's 
one of the reasons why there's all sorts of horror adjacent imagery in in the fetish scene and in the S and M scene. Like you you like though you know if you have an S and M sex room, it's literally called a dungeon, which is of course at the bottom <laughs> of every great vampire castle. Um, you know, because yeah. everybody wants to be a little bit bad. We just, we just, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot when I'm at conventions and I'm giving panels. I call this antisocial wish, wish fulfillment, which mm-hmm. is, you know, I, I think actually necessary for for us to be a functioning society. Like the the idea that we can look at pieces of fiction and get the the sort of more um lurid impulses out through something like a movie or a comic book or a video game and you know monsters allow us that uh, ability like if somebody is annoying in a monster movie the monster can just kill them uh obviously in real life you can't do that but and you shouldn't but well and the reverse is true in in horror movies the people can kill anybody they think is a monster whereas in real life you're not supposed to go around killing monstrous people unless you're the government apparently um (laughs) but you know so um that's that's the thing it's like i always say that it would be interesting to write uh i the, what i want to write i don't write really john but i always pretend i'm going to um is that what i want to write is a courtroom drama that that's the thing after the person kills the monsters you know and so like people Ooh. are like mm, i don't we don't really believe in vampires so we're not sure that who you killed was a vampire no but they really they were a vampire it's like well we're gonna go ahead and try you anyway well, yeah <laughs> but that's describe- that- yeah, go ahead. You just, right. that's, that, that's the genius of the Night Stalker, of like Jeff Rice and Richard Matson and Dan Curtis. Doing, the end of the Night Stalker is like, oh, Carl Kolchak, you just pounded a stake through that guy's heart. So <laughs> right, I'm going right. to your career and send you out of town so you won't talk about it. Right. So I want but, to write the next but, thing after that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Drew, I, I like your idea. I, I picture, I hope that somewhere there would be a vampire who was the original vampire looking at, at those scenes. Looking at the S and M scene and going dungeon, yeah, that I, I started that like dungeon. <laughs> I can't, like there's somewhere there's a vampire. I was like, that came from me. I just just want to let you know. I don't tell people this a lot, but uh, that's, I was that's the original the du- dungeon. That vampire. whole Dungeons and Dragons thing. That's the whole dungeon thing. <laughs> you know where it led to sex. But, that was me. That would be great. <laughs> Do you remember, by the way, I, I, I know this, but back in Austin, they used to have a thing called Blood Fest, and they finally stopped doing it because the fake blood stained people's clothes and they complained too much. Oh, but it was, funny. It was Jeez, like, it was the coolest scene because they had like, you know, you, you, you'd go in and there was all these blood games going on and girls wrestling in blood and, and, and like, you know, and various red drinks and, there, and it was there's great. There's a whole there I, it it kind of has gone more underground but the uh, drew knows a lot about this as well but the whole vampire werewolf underground scene and their rivalry in underground austin has been it, it's not as big but there are tales upon tales <laughs> about that from that era the, va- the vampires are just prejudiced against my people that's <laughs> um all right i I uh we should we should move on because I know that I know that we're we're well we can take as much time as we like but uh uh we did we mentioned the sex in of, of a meal David Prowse is really cool here it's really cool to see what an Dave amazing Prowse. Dave no Prowse no credited lines. here what a physical uh, you know he's reliable in several hammer movies because he plays the Frankenstein monster twice and he's also uh he's he's also in here he doesn't have any lines um oh that was one more thing that I was thinking that was interesting about Emil um uh Emil speaks but only when he's not performing and to some extent he's always performing around humans around non vampires. So in those he's always he moves very fluidly, he's languid and he's silent. And but when he's alone with his fellow vampires, he's in his plotting mode and suddenly he talks and and has this this, you know, wonderful British voice. But I just thought that was really interesting that Emil's a performer and he's on when he's when he's silent and then he's backstage when he's when he's not. I just thought that was wild. Um okay, so 
I did want to mention um, uh, a couple of uh, w- one thing that was unusual about this. There's a pre-title sequence. We've talked about it a little bit, but this is I don't there aren't often pre-title sequences in Hammer movies. But in this one, you have a almost a minute miniature film, the same way you did in Dracula 80, 1972, where, you know, it has uh, even more so, really, because uh, um, as uh, as John was talking about, you start out with Professor uh, Miller, and he spots his estranged wife luring a child into a into a castle, and you quickly move to their whole scene, a full sex scene, murder of the child, and then uh, the rousing of the townspeople, and then attacking the castle, and, and like all of this stuff, all of it goes on for like fifteen minutes before you even get to the opening credits. It was wild, and I, I just. I thought that was really daring and, and unusual. It's so. it's anything that breaks with form like that is so bold because you, you instinctively we're we're waiting for the credits. We're waiting for like, oh, okay, yes. she's made the movie, with, and we're waiting. We're like, oh, are there no credits? I remember the the first draft. You may know this of of the Exorcist screenplay that William Peter mm-hmm. Blatty wrote. Like the credits came like forty minutes into the movie, suddenly stopped, wow. and it was like The Exorcist <laughs> you know, by William Peter Blatty. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's that idea. I love things like that because it's so bold that you're just you, you, because you're almost you're almost you're made nervous waiting for the form of cinema you're used to, yes. and you're not getting it. Like when you go to a Bond movie now, you're like, let's see what they do in the pre-title, and it's sort of expected, but yes. but not in a movie like this. No. Yeah. No. So that was that was really really cool. Um, so uh, uh, now I'll throw it open to the group. Is there anything that I've forgotten to lead us towards we haven't touched on that we really should well like, i want to what... shout out the circus because apparently it's somebody something called the billy smarts circus was like some of the circus performers and extras and background artists i'm assuming the people leaping through the air are probably these guys um I, the, and they the, brought the, the animals that they, they brought the, the animals, animals are amazing the woman yeah. like i said the dance the weird dance with the you know the painted naked woman um i think that it's really you know kind of um with we get to see a circus also uh, you know we're watching this movie but yes. we're also watching this amazing yeah. show and i just thought that was um that was really cool like art, something art, about art, the, artist, the tiger wise. woman dancer well that that you just mentioned her whole performance when you think of her her nakedness i mean she's wearing a, a bikini patch but but and she's painted but her nakedness the extreme nudity in the opening sex scene like this is this is if you go like you and i go to the movies all the time because we subscribe to amc theaters if we go out to a movie this friday night and it's a vampire movie or it's a slasher movie or it's a whatever i guarantee you you will not see a fraction as much skin as we see in this movie from 1972 i don't know what's happened i'm glad for it honestly well i mean what's happened is that they've stopped they've started telling people do you you know do you want not you to want be to new this. to this movie? Yeah. <laughs> and they're exactly. like, I'd rather exactly. not. Some people are like, I'm fine yeah, with ju- it. Ju- yeah, Julia's right. That was a long time coming. And, you know, when you read interviews with some of the Hammer actresses, an, ab- an actress like Maddie Smith from, mm. from uh, Vampire Lovers was like, oh, no, I was very uncomfortable with it. Whereas wow. Ingrid Pitt was like, yeah, I-, I was fine with it. But nowadays, Maddie Smith would go to the, you know, uh, intimacy coordinator or the director and say, I'm not comfortable with this. We have to figure something else out. It would happen. But, Julie, I want to hop on one thing you said, which is about the, the dance. Mm. You know, so, so the, it's the first performance of the circus. The townspeople are just saying, oh, it's a circus. What is this going to be like? And they stop the movie for this S&M dance routine yes. where the woman is painted like a green tiger and the, she rips off the man's skirt and it's very sexual and he's wrapping a whip around her. Meanwhile, we're, we're cross-cutting to a tiger having an orgasm that's legs twitching in the cage. And the movie <laughs> stops for that just to say to the world, this is Vampire Circus. Yeah, and right. any movie that does that, that has the balls to say, I'm going to stop and I'm going to tell you what I am. It's like The Witches does. At the end of The Witches, there's this, there's this like sort of black mask that goes on forever that's this very stylized dance sequence. Or Kiss of the Vampires has a huge mask ball in the middle of it, and the movies yes. just stop for choreography that tells a story and stakes a claim to storytelling. And it's something I try to do in Penny Dreadful all the time, that every time I wrote like a big dance sequence, like Showtime was like, oh, good Lord. It's <laughs> choreographers and rehearsals. Right. And, well, oh. I said last so, time, I know, I know Bridgerton doesn't need me to, to advertise it but Bridgerton does that you know it'll just stop and just have a full dance sequence anyway Drew what are you going to say it looks like uh, well I I'll just say- wanted to say as somebody that watched Penny Dreadful religiously uh, I appreciated all of that stuff so 
you know, yeah. thank you. I I can I uh, I know exactly where you're coming from. So Jason and I, when we wrote our first screenplay that then got turned into a comic, Clockworks, we wrote a whole ballroom scene because we yes. were like, I don't. <laughs> wanted a nobody know game. nobody knows us as as screenwriters, but. I love the idea of introducing all the villains with this ballroom scene. Yeah. And, you know, we had this, this, you know, we have this part where uh, our female protagonist doesn't have, she's missing an arm and he, he fake takes her arm and all this stuff. But I, I was, I was like, you know, I don't know if we can get this made, but it has to have, all our villains have to get introduced in a ballroom scene because that's the way to do it. So I can absolutely understand. I appreciate that we have similar ideas on that. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> that's I, amazing. I, I applaud any time, you know, this is why I love old Gene Kelly movies is they would suddenly stop for an entire, an entire like modern ballet, you know. And I, and, I was just yeah. looking at John Logan's IMDb and I saw something about Gene Kelly. I was like, hmm? What's that? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've dabbled in the odd musical, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, but again, but again, it's interesting about musicals and dance numbers. Do you integrate it or do you not? You know, the, the dance number in, in Vampire Circus, the movie literally stops for it. Right. Yes. But, but, you know, something like American in Paris, it's storytelling through dance, which is something Fred Astaire has, you know, sort of invented. And it's, it's, you know, like you, Judah, I love musicals. And I love working on them. And I love exploring them. And, and you know, but again, it's, it's the boldness of the musical form, like the boldness of a really good Hammer film that I love more. Than, I just love boldness. It's like mm. there, there, there are two kinds of playwrights. There's a Chekhovian playwright who can, who can break your heart with reality and like a shattering of a teacup. And then there's a Shakespearean playwright who will, who will shoot for the fences and fail and be dramatic and large. Uh, I, that's, that's what has always excited me as a dramatist. That's I heard true. you say that once uh, uh, with Julia and I watched you in a, leer, in a, in a lecture where, where you said something about like, go for the big line, basically. Like, yeah. like you know, and it's such a, such a wonderful piece of advice. It's like, mm. because it fits with something that we didn't hear you say, but we did hear you say earlier tonight, which is forget about form. Go for, go for the story, go for the effect. And something that you said in your lecture is ultimately your only test is whether people are responding to it, whether it works, you know, whether it's, yeah. it's a, uh, yeah, which, which I, I thought was, I thought was incredible. Um, uh, calling out some of the other, the other performers, I just wanted to mention, um, so Lala Ward uh, is there, uh, and she was, you see her in a lot of shots from the, uh, the Doctor Who stuff of the era, because she, oh yeah, I, she, that's where I knew her from originally. Yes. Like, I watched Doctor Who as a kid before it was cool to like Doctor Who. <laughs> it was very, very not cool to like Doctor Who when I was in grade school. When it was just on 4.30 uh, in the afternoon PBS, on a Saturday yeah. on PBS. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I remembered her. I mean, when I first saw this, oh, hey, you know, this is this actress who I, you know, knew through Doctor Who. She's great. She's always fantastic. Uh, it was very cool to see her. Uh, and just her, I love her delight in the seduction of the innocent and yes. for just wreaking havoc upon the townspeople. She's yes. always just smiling. This is the best. I love ripping through a town and just causing havoc. Yes. And, you know, well, are you talking about, no, you're talking about uh, the, the gypsy woman that she's credited? No, is that who's no, oh, no. She's, uh, Ward. she's the, Lala Ward is the oh. young, the young one, the, 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 uh, the twin, the so-called. Oh, okay. Twin. Okay. The twin. Yeah, yeah. Cause I was going to say, cause the, 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 the gypsy woman, the lady, um, is actually just a glamour of Anna, which I thought was really bizarre. That's a really oh, wild she's choice. She's not right? a vampire. No, she's I find that a... really interesting that she's not necessarily a vampire, but she is supernatural in the way she's that not she's a vampire because she's bit... the one who's able to rip off the right. cross. Yeah. No, I'm saying though that she still is kind of supernatural despite not being a vampire because she is a kind of almost shape shapeshifter yeah. of sorts. I, 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 you know, also find it interesting that, you know, her, her choice of a guise is an older, I mean, not old, old woman, but no, an older but you're woman. you're right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, the, mom. I, I, the mom of the circus. I, I jokingly call her uh, circus cougar when we, yes. were, when we were watching it, but. The well, cougar with the panther. How about that? Yes. The cougar with the panther. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's. It, you know, she's an interesting character, you know, 
period because she's the count's lover at the beginning yeah. and then he kind of sends her off on this this mission to get his redneck cousin to come revive him how kick-ass and, a line is that by the way when he says go to my brother emil find the circus of nice that's like that's like the beginning of a hitchcock movie i mean that's like that's like it's dying a, it's so but great then, yeah she took 15 years. She's been hanging out as, as yeah. this, this fortune teller, ringmaster woman for 15 years. It's She took her time. I mean, I guess time is relative if you're a vampire. But, and you're dead. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. She's it's, also... She, I, she's also incredibly strong. Yeah. Like, that character is a rock. And again, uh, shout out to a drama who says her very first... The first word she speaks... They say, what are you doing in town? To steal the money from dead men's eyes. Yes. Like, I could nice. die happy if I wrote a yeah. line like that in the first <laughs> right? line of, a, of a, like, a powerful gypsy woman in the circus. Well, it's you wrote the, about the glee but... with which she, she's like, this is what we do. Like, just there's yeah. like this powerful, just like, yeah, this is us. Ah, that is there's, fantastic. The way that she delivers a lot of her lines are this this sort of open mouthed, just salivating kind of, uh, you know, she's <laughs> she's very excited. She's She enjoys what she's saying. And she reminded me a lot, you know, John, you wrote about Martine Beswick in, in, uh, in Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. Very much the same thing. A sort of Every line feels knowing and 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 multiple meaning and ironic and and well the and... the ring the ringmaster version of her is way more interesting to me than the sort of young cheesecake you know hammer glamour Agreed. character that yes. we have in, yeah. in it like she's she like she just draws your attention and yeah. uh, you know like and and the woman honestly like she's older but she's she's very striking. Like, like she. Oh no! She yeah, no, no doubt about it. Master, yeah. her ringmaster co and everything. I just, I, I love everything about, like, in a in a perfect alternate reality where people cosplay uh, Hammer characters instead of Deadpool. I would, I would see <laughs> a zillion people cosplaying this character. Agreed. Oh, son, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she's she's amazing. Um, so that I oh, and I I finally I want to mention Thorley Walters, who is like one of these guys like michael ripper a wonderful character actor who shows up uh you know i thought that i remembered him from a lot of other stuff but i mainly remember him from hammer movies like like and this is you know he's he he's always fun he's always reliable he wears stupid wigs it's it's so <laughs> neat to see the hair pieces they put thoroughly walters in so that that was that was really cool um so we should we should wrap up what what did what did what an interesting film. I find it interesting before we go to our final thoughts. John, you said that this is one of your favorite. This is your your Desert Island Hammer movie. For me that would be Brides of Dracula. What I think is interesting is that that these two favorites do not feature Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, which is sort of the Peter Cushing the ultimate Brides parent. Dracula. Peter Cushing, yes, but not Christopher yeah. Lee. In other words, there's all of these there is no world of forms rock solid perfect hammer movie like that has all of the elements like it you never you never get everything to line up you never get both peter cushing and christopher lee and um you know the the original uh, uh composer and 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 all that stuff you never get all of it but so many of the films come really close to having all that stuff that you want um anyway okay let's get our final thoughts and hit on anything that you like in this um but uh, i i i just can't tell you how how delighted we've been and, and john i'm sorry that we've been falling all over all over ourselves uh <laughs> um uh so all right um john uh vampire circus what, what do you what do you what what's your wrap-up thoughts yeah i mean it's it's um uh, it's not for all tastes you know it's provocative and shocking in a great way it's also it's also so ghoulishly fun but but i find it mesmerizing because you know it's 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 Hammer, it's Fellini, it's Pasolini. It's, it's, it's this weird amalgamation of, of cinema sort of at that moment that's very exciting. And, you know, in, in a world where we're more and more constrained by what we can say, what we can show, uh, not wanting to offend the boldness of this movie, I applaud to, to the heavens. Wow. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Tony, what about you? Yeah, I, I've enjoyed this 
since you know we were hanging out and watching this and i think that was my first exposure but re-watching it and just seeing the layers and layers of just cool stuff that just extremely lurid visuals matched by just fascinating bits of both acting and screenwriting um i i put this up i am so sad i don't own like the disc of this and i need to fix that mm. immediately that's the one thing i saw last night like why don't i have this is there a blu-ray um, of this i, I don't even uh, know i, I think okay. there was a more recent one yeah. if i'm not mistaken i forgot who put it out but i remember it came across and i don't have it and that made me sad uh you know but it's something i definitely need to own because it is just it's it's fantastic uh you know like i said layered um great performances also influential like i can't believe that i mean it could happen but I want to say, like, for example, the village slash circus that's in Vampire Hunter D, uh, you know, the novel Demon Death Chase that was then made into uh, Bloodlust. Like, that seems to have touchstones to the circus, the way that they are portrayed. And you see so many other things that kind of touch on this. Um, I... Yeah, I'll. This is going back in rotation now that we've discovered it. <laughs> Rediscovering was yes. I'd love so. to know from from each of you when we're done. What is the next Hammer film you're going to watch now that we've discussed this? Uh, um, so so you can answer that now, or you can answer it when we come around. Do you do you know like what what your next Hammer film will be, Tony? We'll, we'll, sorry, we'll, sorry. We'll come back. Uh, yeah, well, no, I I don't know. I actually. It was going to be on my uh, list, but I'm I'm watching a ton of films at the virtual Chattanooga Film Fest, so it'll be a while before I get back to Hammer. <laughs> I'm watching right. tons of stuff. Very cool, John. Which one? Which one do you think you'll 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 have to get back to? Yeah, I've been on a very deep Hammer dive because I'm writing a piece for the last issue of Little Shop of Horror, which is a great uh, magazine. It deals a lot with Hammer. Uh, I've sort of fallen really in love with Plague of the Zombies. And I think I'm going to go, go back to Plague of the Zombies because to me, the single most frightening moment in any Hammer movie is the appearance of the first zombie at the tin mine. I, I, it, hmm. it still terrifies me to this day. So that's next up for me. That's, that's, that's great. Wonderful. The, that's Cornish, great. the Cornish horror Plague of yes. the Zombies. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, Drew. What about you, my friend? What are your final thoughts and what's your next Hammer? Well, first of all, we didn't talk about it, so I'm going to just say it as a gore hound this movie has one of the best decapitations mm. in oh, yeah. any movie <laughs> the hero decapitates the count by putting his crossbow around his neck <laughs> and firing it and the wire decapitates him that, that is, is some next level move. vampire slayer shit my friend <laughs> yeah that is awesome <laughs> And I, I, if we, if that, if I did, I would have been, I would wake up at like 3 a.m. and go, I can't believe I didn't mention the decapitation if I had it done it right now. So that, it, that alone, all the other stuff that is awesome about this movie, but that alone is reason enough to watch this movie because it is so badass. Yeah, um, that's one of those, that's one of those, damn it. I, no, I can't do like. Oh, oh, I wish I had done that. There should you be can. like. Go oh ahead. yeah, you there, can. <laughs> there, there should be a a real Alamo Draft House of decapitations, and that there, be there, I, I think there has been. Uh, there's a, <laughs> there's a fantastic best best kills, and I think one of the best kills features with was decap attack i think one year i'll have to look again but i'm pretty sure that that's happened i don't know if this was one of them. this was not in it you right. need to you need to you need to put in a word we'll, um, we'll fix that yeah the best yeah. is david um, warner next, getting it from the glass next in, in hammer the hammer movie yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think I'm going to go, uh, I'm, I'm going to stick with with uh, vampires and go with my old standby Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter. Because really? I, I do, either that or Vampire Lovers. Like, I'm I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm now in the, the late stage hammer, uh, you know. I was feeling the reptile earlier, but now, now I mean, they're all good. Like, there's no yeah. Yeah. wrong decision here. But the, the more I... I did, you know, the more I say it, I'm, I'm thinking Vampire Lovers now, actually. So I'm going to dig out my Blu-ray, uh, you know, going to get me some... some Vampire Lovers is so good. Oh Ingrid my gosh. Pitt action. It is so good. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, also, uh, you know what, I'll save this for, for endorsement. All right. Julia, am I imagining that, did you and I have 
sit and talk to Ingrid Pitt. But were you there? Was that I was that us? I think at, so. At yeah. one of the at one of the shows, and yeah, yeah. And she was For talking sure. about escaping Hungary and and everything. What a yeah. neat lady! I mean, like a really okay. really neat, just wonderful lady. Um, so what about you? What are your final thoughts? And are you interested in watching Vampire Lovers with me? My final thought is that the Circus of Nights indeed is a hundred delights. <laughs> um, I enjoyed this film. It's really great conversation. I'm just so pleased that and honored that John Logan would want to join us. And it's been really, really fun and, and interesting to hear. I always feel, um, and this is true for Jason as well. I always feel um, like I don't know how to say words when I'm with writers. <laughs> oh wow you said that's so much better than i than i could have um so i appreciate that that is so sweet and um, and not true so uh, we, we need well it's you true for lives. john logan for sure julia um, i had a i had a panic attack before i had to go on this episode because oh. i knew we were going to be oh. recording with john so like do, it, writers yeah. get nervous too well I yeah. feel that. Also, I like all day, all day to my husband. I was like, okay, 7.30 tonight, Pacific Coast time. It's my castle of horror guys. And, and he's like, really? Like, yeah, yeah. Those guys, like, yeah, the ones like from Colorado and Austin, I listen to all the time. And like, oh my I'm going to talk to them. It's, yeah, I love you guys. You guys do the best. You, so, you know what's great about what you do? You let the conversation go and you just loop it around you know in such interesting ways so i was i was very excited for tonight and i hope well, i didn't I embarrass could, i could not be thank smiling so any much. bigger yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. amazing thank you so much. Thank that's you so much. cool um my jason i don't know i suppose you always make me watch vampire lovers or whatever else but i was just looking at a list of hammer films and i'm wondering have we watched um horror express i've never I don't is horror, horror express i'm not it sure if not. that's a hammer yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, it does not. feature Peter Cushing. Oh, we did watch it. Was... it so oh, so it's faking movie. me out. This article was pretending these were all Hammer, uh, Hammer movies, but I guess they're <laughs> but not. But it's in the public domain, so we could even show it somewhere if we wanted to. Yeah, I this mean, article, it's... Entertainment Weekly, seems to think it's a Hammer film. It's so one weird. of those movies <laughs> that, that <laughs> seems like it's a Hammer movie, but it's not. That yeah. is well, my shame favorite. on you, Entertainment Weekly. <laughs> yeah, it's like Creeping Flesh or Blood Beast Terror or those Tygon Aramicus ones. You know? Yes. And, and Creeping Creeping Flesh was another one I pitched to Jason. Yes, I like that movie a lot. Time. I, I Me too. by the way, I'm a sucker for any of the. I mean, we talked about this last week. Um, you know, any movie that's not Hammer but kind of looks like Hammer or feels like, <laughs> like you know, if you were doing a long release of DVDs, you go, well, these are the ones that. You kind of have to explore all of that stuff. I love the Tigon, the Amicus, all of that. Um, yes, Julia, I interrupted you. I'm I'm sorry. Did you? Oh, no, uh, I'm, um, I'm good. I was just saying, if that's a, but if it's not a Hammer movie, then I guess I'm stuck with. There's that. there's <laughs> never not a good reason to watch Horror Express though. Horror sure. Express is wonderful, and it has Telly Savalas. So so that's you know as a and, as a Cossack. Yes. Oh, he's he's what. <laughs> You know, I discovered it recently. I, I I apologize for just diverging, but Telly Savalas made this movie, and um, it was called Lisa and the Devil. Um, but it was also called House of Exorcism. Has anybody here seen Lisa and the Devil or House of Exorcism? Oh, homework. Okay, <laughs> Lisa and the Devil is a is an Italian uh, uh, haunted house creepy movie that has uh, Telly Savalas, uh, you know, he's the American star as, as uh, the servant of this house. And, and it's got spookiness. I, I really can't remember the plot. It was weird. But what's really interesting is that in like 1974, after Lisa and the devil didn't do all that well, they cut like 40% of it and shot new stuff to go around it, to turn it into an exorcist ripoff. So you have this, this weird, um, splashy bloody italian um uh ghost story horror haunted castle thing and then you've got a girl and you got one of the actors from that story now in a frame story sitting on a bed and they're doing the exorcism stuff it is the most weirdly strangely constructed crazy town movie ever and it's two movies so you get to watch both of them and just it, it was just a delight so so if you haven't discovered that that's my endorsement i'll just skip any endorsement this is my endorsement <laughs> is lisa and the devil house of exorcism two terrible movies made into a, a great a great evening is so 
that's me. Uh, all right, let's get let's get endorsements from people who have probably something better to recommend. Uh, John, what what would you recommend? <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah. Feel free it's to so do hard. shameless about... self promotion. <laughs> yes. Shameless. Well, no. Next year, I'd recommend the movie Michael about Michael Jackson. But uh, oh, yeah, nice. now I, I was, I was thinking all day about what, what to endorse, and I'm going to endorse like probably my entry drug into um, horror and and entertainment, which was Dark Shadows. Uh, and there's a lot of entry points to Dark Shadows. You know, the original series has 1,225 episodes. There's the House yeah. of Dark Shadows movie, which is fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of ways to go into that, but it's it's a wonderful talk about a, a dark fairy tale world. Uh, you know, if you want to go back to a time where there's real sort of monster mashup going on in the most strangest, most most outre ways, uh, I recommend dipping into a little Barnabas Collins out of the box, Dark Shadows. Wow. Beautiful. I absolutely. And there's so many places to, I like playing it sometimes, like while I'm working, just having it play in the background because yeah. it's impossible like to. It's you, you're not going to sit and watch 1200 episodes of it, so you may as well. well maybe, just, you, maybe you're oh. not, All right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually found uh, because I knew my actually, you know, probably one of the other reasons why I like horror. My mom mentioned that when she was really young, like she would try to rush home and, and watch it, and I found a huge chunk of it on VHS at like a half price books, and so I just went, How? much can I buy all of it for and gave it to her. I don't know if she watched them all, but like it was one of those like, hey, so you had fond memories about this. Here's here's as much as you can watch right now, <laughs> like a few years ago. So wow. Yeah. It's awesome. And she when she was telling me about it as a kid, I was just like, what? There was a soap opera that's a, that's vampires. I can't believe that's real. Amazing. We did an episode on well both of the Dark Shadows movies, but I kind of really liked the one. Um, uh, I guess it's called Night of Dark Shadows. So wh whichever one is the second one with Kate Jackson, where where it's yeah. not the Barnabas story, it's a ghost story, uh, and it's got David Selby and 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 oh my god, it's such a wonderful like little nineteen seventies gothic, and I just I just love it. And now I want to watch that tonight. This is always this is always so fun. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's weird. You come out and go, ah. Uh, Tony, what about you? My big endorsement is, like I said before, Chattanooga Film Festival once again is having their virtual festival. And it's amazing. Uh, lots of great indie films. Uh, so far, I've seen uh, an 80s spoof, Blind Cop 2. Um, I've watched a nice indie film called uh, Love and Work. Uh, another hilarious uh, sci-fi time travel-esque thing called Someone Dies, um, Video Visions. And then also, but in addition to that, they run this, what they call Red Eye, at close to midnight mm. uh, genre film. So the first night was Wild Zero, which is a big, uh, just, I'm a huge fan. Uh, last night it was Night Flyers, which is hard. Like not, not maybe, you know, I watched it with Rain. Uh, I had forgotten a lot of it, but there's a lot of cool stuff in Night Flyers. And also uh, I told Jason, I told you about this, John, I don't know if you've seen this, a movie called Pin. Mm. If you are into ventriloquism, you need to see Pin. P-I-N. I've seen this. Uh, it, whoa. <laughs> Canadian, <laughs> Canadian horror movie. Yeah. Um what the late 70s or the 80s? I I, I can't uh, 80 yeah, the 80s. Um evidently it showed back to back with some other horror movie. I forgot which one. They did an introduction on uh Sci-Fi Channel back in the day before it was mm. SY when it was actually like Sci-Fi, you know, spelled correctly. <laughs> and evidently messed up a lot of people who were there to <laughs> just who weren't expecting <laughs> that. Uh you know, it does deal kind of with mental health, like schizophrenia in a way that 80s does. And that's not as great. But just when you, uh, I, I pitched it to Jason because I was like, this is, Jason needs to see this. But John, when you mentioned it, when you showed us uh, everything oh, that happened, yes, like, oh, you need to see this movie. It is, <laughs> whoo, it's something. I was not expecting where it goes. Uh, yeah. It, I, I was surprised, but I love that. And that's another thing I love about film festivals is you have these people with their own interests curating this stuff and, and it recharges me. Um, I keep crazy vampire hours anyway. Mm. So these red eye every night, I'm, you know, when I can, I, I hook the laptop to the projector and watch it movies how they're supposed to, supposed to be. And uh, mm. I have been really enjoying. And then the fact that, that during lockdown, Chattanooga pivoted to having a virtual 
uh, screening section and they kept it, which is really hard to do with the studios streaming the way they do. Yeah. Um, that's that's hard to do. I, I know this now that I work with the theater, you know, with, with Alamo. So um, it's, I really uh, enjoy the fact that they kept the virtual screening and, and they're great every year. They're anti-AI, they're, they're pro, uh, you know, just voices from all over. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed with, with their offerings and their support of cinema uh, and indie cinema, genre cinema. So uh, I, if you ever, they, I think they just discounted passes, virtual passes, mm. um, which is great. So uh, if you're looking for something to do, they, the virtual screening is great. It's really seamless. Um, I'm fascinated by how, how an indie, you know, a more independent film festival can do all of this and do it so seamlessly. Um, definitely kudos to that whole group. Well, we'll get this show up on up tomorrow night and there's still, there is a discounted pass for just the next, the last few days of the Chattanooga yeah. festival. So that's, that's really great. In fact, cool. immediately after this, I'm going to go catch whatever the red eye is tonight. I'm about to go stream it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, Drew, what do you have for us? Uh, a, a few things. Um, I, first of all, I don't know why people are complaining about the season finale of Doctor Who. I loved it. So I'm just going to raise my virtual middle finger to all the haters <laughs> on online right now. Um, when I watch Doctor Who, I, one of the things I get out of it is that it's an essentially a, even though there is dark stuff on it occasionally, it's an essentially an optimistic character. And as somebody that is inherently cynical, um, I find uh, that I, I need that to get me through my week. Along those same lines on Tubi, I've been going all the way back to the, the unit era of Doctor Who, and I've been watching all of the uh, Robert Delgado uh, Master episodes. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think I pretty much decided after looking at this guy for, um, you know, several episodes that I think I could do. And if, if I just shaved my beard back and like slicked my hair back severely enough, I think I could cosplay him pretty well. I just master. need to get the near, yeah, the, the specifically the, didn't Delgado. he have like, he had some, did he have like, like some little white streaks? Yeah, in, I would in, just have to yeah. streak it, but I have pretty much the same beard as him. Gosh, so, like, I, you great. know, that might be coming to a convention near you. Um, you know, I, I, I will talk more about this next week, but I am about to launch uh, an Indiegogo for Halloween Man. We've had some some financial hardships this year, so uh, we're we're trying to play catch up. Uh, this is a way. Fans can come in and help us out. Uh, like I said, I'll talk more about this uh, ne next episode because it'll, we're launching it next Wednesday. Um, I, I wanted to take a second, though. Again, I, 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 I said that I was going to act like a normal person, but I lied. Um, John, I told you, don't start now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I just wanted to say once again how much Penny Dreadful, you know, meant to me specifically. Uh, you know. The, the Ethan on the show, like I, I, you know, I, I relate to that character in ways that I, you know, more so than almost any other fictional character, uh, you know, somebody that, that, you know, I have dissociative identity disorder, so I find werewolves to be very relatable characters, and he is my favorite modern werewolf, so... I just wanted to say I don't know if I will ever get another chance like this to say that to to some to the actual creator how much that character meant to me and you know uh, there were you know sometimes when I was down that character got me got me through so you know thank you and in a long way to make this an endorsement if you haven't yet go watch Penny Dreadful. Thank you. That's very that's very kind. Thank you for that. You're you're very welcome. And I just want to say, Drew, congratulations that you're going to be a dad. Jamie's going to be a mom soon. Uh -huh. I know you guys finally went public with that news. So congratulations. Yeah. And yeah. and she's going to be born <laughs> on the full moon, appropriate for for Luna Bella, our our little oh, moon. Beautiful, oh my beautiful moon. Yeah. What a great moon! So lovely. excited. Yeah. Well, she'll be she'll be born that day if she doesn't come early. I, I I love how you guys think that she's just going to be like, yeah, sure, I'll wait till you're ready. 
<laughs> Babies don't we're, always want to wait. We're thinking, we're thinking positively. <laughs> All right, then. I will, will also go, be positive. Yeah, we, 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 we prepare... We're prepared if she comes early, but we're 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 hoping that things go as planned, I guess. Uh, so far, Jamie's pregnancy has been uh, knock on wood a very smooth pregnancy. So Wonderful. you know, hopefully, it continues to be that way. Best wishes. Um, so I would like to endorse Jason. Am I allowed to endorse the movie that we just talked about with the director today? Is oh. that you is can that kosher? Endorse not... anything you like. Okay. The... Um, yeah, we talked to Robert Kiviat. Kiviat. Um, today, Jason, let me sit in on a Castle um, Castle Talk uh, yeah. interview. Um, he created. He's created something called the Mandela Effect phenomenon, and it is. What did you say it was coming out July 9th? July like 9th, Yeah. yeah. Um, oh my gosh, it was, I thought it was going to be kind of a cool like pop culture, you know, thing about how um, people remember the Berenstein Bears as being, the Berenstein Bears being the Berenstein Bears or all those things, which is all in there. But it ends up being this really deep, intellectual, thought-provoking movie that explores like all these amazing, it gets into quantum physics and spiritual all this stuff and it's like uh, it's like one of my favorite movies which is what the bleep do we know um and so we talked to him and it was a really fun conversation but and i just love that movie so i can't wait for everybody to be able to to see it um and then just before we close i wanted to say um john if you're ever in colorado you and tommy uh please let us know so we can take you out to jason's favorite um tiki bar the only tiki bar that we have locally <laughs> yes yes yeah um that was that was a really really good time and uh thank you julia and and, and uh I, I, my endorsement actually is a book coming out that uh we are the publishers of comes out tomorrow called vinyl wonderland which i am by a guy named mark rigney i'm very excited about this book because it's about this teenager working in a record store a vintage record store in the 80s um because he dropped out of college at a high school and needs to make some money and he winds up having to take it over when the record store owner gets sick. And it turns out there is a locked door with a Elvis standee in front of it. And behind that door is a tunnel to another dimension of nothing but miles and miles of junk. And whoever controls it gives you a rule that you can pick only one thing. And it is whatever you need the most. And it is the wildest, most interesting sort of i didn't even know this americana fantasy that i'm just very proud of and 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 that comes out tomorrow so i'm i'm excited about about vinyl wonderland and that's um that's that's it uh and i'm going to take everybody's recommendations and i'm definitely going to play some more old school dark shadows because i want to um oh by the way john there's a there's a soundtrack that i found called something like back at the blue whale and it's nothing yeah. but like the music that they play. <laughs> yeah, I have I have all of those right here. <laughs> oh my god! Amazing, <laughs> literally awesome. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> great. It's embarrassing. I tell you, come to California, come to Los Angeles. I'll take you into my horror room. <laughs> awesome. That's wonderful. All right. Fantastic. Um, this has been a, a delightful um, uh, highlight of our career. And, and I'm so honored that you would join us. We're all, we're, we're all honored, as, as you can tell. But thank you Come so much. Thank you, thank you for putting yes, up definitely. with our nervousness. And, um, and I, I, can't, I can't wait for people to get to hear this episode. Don't be a stranger. Reach out to any of us anytime. Come to Texas. Come to Colorado. Absolutely. And uh, and good luck, good luck with every good luck on Broadway. I know that I know that there's, thank you. there's thank a you. lot and all going of you, on. Please, please keep. I know you sent some chat things, but I don't know how to respond to those. So please <laughs> email me. Let's keep in touch. I'd be come back anytime. This is such a pleasure because I said I, when I first emailed Jason, I said, "What I love most about your podcast is it's like." hanging around with all those friends who love horror that I don't have. Uh, so uh, I love it. it's, it's incredible. It's great. Uh, well, we would, we, we love to count you as a friend, especially now. So one of us, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Gabba, Gabba. All right. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody. I'll talk to you soon. Right. Bye. Take care.